This video was brought to you by Brilliant. If you follow European politics, even just occasionally, you've probably heard about the Green New Deal, an ambitious proposal by the European Commission to make the EU climate neutral by the year 2050. As part of their net zero plans, the EU has been negotiating two pieces of car-related environmental legislation, the new Euro 7 emissions framework and a ban on the sale of petrol and diesel cars by 2035. Now, while there hasn't been much on it in the English-speaking press, the new regulations have raised staunch opposition among member states, especially in Germany and Central Europe. So in this video, we're going to take a look at these new regulations, why some EU states aren't keen, and what this dispute says about the EU's green ambitions. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. So let's start with the Euro 7. Technically, the Euro 7 is just the latest set of European emission standards, which regulate how much pollution EU cars and lorries can emit. The first of these EU directives, known as Euro 1, was implemented all the way back in 1992 in order to tackle pollution from passenger cars and light lorries. However, as European politicians and electorates have focused more and more on climate change, the EU has passed more and more directives, tackling the amount of nitrogen oxide, carbon monoxide, hydrocarbon, ammonia, and other particulates can be emitted from each car, depending on whether they run on petrol or diesel. As such, EU cars today are required to undergo a test cycle, known as the New European Driving Cycle, to measure whether they adhere to regulations before entering the marketplace. And as you might expect, in the years since Euro 1, these rules have become a fair bit stricter. To give you a sense of quite how far they've come, consider the fact that under Euro 1, diesel cars could emit 970 milligrams of nitrogen dioxide and nitric oxide per kilometre. But now, under the most recent Euro 6 regulations, which came into play in 2014, it's just 80 milligrams, less than a tenth of the original allowance. In fact, these requirements are so strict that some car companies tried to fake their test results. You might even remember the Volkswagen emissions scandal, where the company initially falsified its cycle test by using technology that only activated emission controls during the test. Anyway, you get the idea. Since Euro 1 in 1992, the EU has been creating stricter and stricter emissions tests for cars. Now, given that Euro 6 was introduced nearly a decade ago, and European politicians and electorates are more concerned about climate issues than ever before, Euro 7 was pretty much inevitable. It was first proposed by the European Commission in November of last year, and if everything goes to plan, is set to be implemented sometime before July 2025. According to the Commission's proposal, Euro 7 would standardise emissions requirements for all vehicles, regardless of whether they're personal, commercial, diesel, petrol, cars, lorries, buses, vans, whatever. All vehicles would have to adhere to the same rules. Euro 7 would also set limits on previously unregulated pollutants, such as nitrous oxide, and it will be the first regulation worldwide to set additional limits for particular emissions from brakes and microplastic emissions from tyres. Additionally, it requires any vehicle to be able to meet these new standards for at least 200,000 kilometres and 10 years of use doubling the existing durability requirements set under Euro 6. There will also be new regulations for electric cars related to the durability of their batteries and require that vehicles provide ways to measure their emissions throughout their vehicle's lifetime, not just during tests. And alongside this entire plan, the EU has also proposed a total ban on the sales of new diesel and petrol cars from 2035, which is certainly a huge deal. Now, originally, it didn't look like either Euro 7 or the 2035 ban were going to be all that controversial. In fact, the 2035 ban was approved by the European Parliament in February, 
and no one was all that fussed about Euro 7 when it was first announced in November. However, in the past month or so, a car-friendly coalition of member states, including Germany, Italy, Poland, Bulgaria, and the Czech Republic, have come out against these new rules. Now, these are generally countries with big national car companies or where the automobile industry employs a significant number of people. It's no coincidence, for example, that Germany, Poland, and the Czech Republic have the most people employed in the automotive industry anywhere in the EU. Anyway, this pro-car coalition forced last-minute amendments to the 2035 ban last month, carving out an exemption for combustion engines that are compatible with so-called e-fuels. And they're also currently trying to convince the rest of Europe to water down the new Euro 7 directives. Now, arguably, the most vocal opponent to Euro 7 has been the Czech Republic, home to the car company Skoda and one of the most car-focused economies in Europe. Now, this Czech resistance has largely been led by Czech Conservative MEP Alexandra Vondra, who's been appointed as the EU's rapporteur and the lead negotiator for Euro 7. They argue that the Euro 7's rules will make car ownership unaffordable for most people and thereby cripple mass market car brands like Skoda, who have already warned the EU that they'll have to cut 3,000 jobs if the new rules come into effect without being watered down. Other European politicians have also said similar things. Italy's transport minister, Matteo Salvini, described Euro 7 as suicide and ideological fundamentalism that would benefit China to the detriment of the European car industry. Now, the EU unsurprisingly disagrees with this. In fact, the EU thinks Euro 7 is a great investment. That's because European Commission research indicates that the new rules will only add about 100 euros to the cost of your average car. And because these emissions have significant health and environmental consequences, every euro spent on Euro 7 regulations will save Europe more than 5 euros on health and environmental costs. And nonetheless, at the moment, it looks like the Czech-led efforts are having some success. As well as the Czech Republic, the so-called anti-Euro 7 coalition now contains Germany, Italy, Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, Portugal, and Romania. And the shift in German stance here is particularly important, given that it's the largest member state in the EU and has been a long-term proponent of a faster green transition. Overall, it looks like this pro-car alliance are generally happy with the new regulations on tyres, brakes, and electric batteries. But their main aim is to get rid of emission standards related to additional pollutants, as well as the real-time portable emissions probes on cars. Now, obviously, we don't know what the final proposal will look like, but Vondra sounds pretty confident that the regulations will eventually be watered down to meet their standards. Ultimately, then, this is important because it's bad news for anyone who takes the green transition seriously. It's not that the opponents of Euro 7 don't have a point, or that the jobs that would have been lost are meaningless, but a successful green transition will require tough sacrifices. And the fact that even wealthy member states like Germany are resisting any injury to their car industry doesn't bode well. Now, obviously, this is a huge decision for Europe to have to make, but one smaller, easier decision that you can make is improving your skills and your career prospects with Brilliant.org. That's because while we all know that the promise of AI is that it will make our lives easier, it's very possible that it will make our work lives more difficult, replacing some people and requiring different skills of others. Brilliant, however, is the best way of improving your STEM skills quickly and in a fun way, investing in your own human intelligence. That's because Brilliant has thousands of lessons, from foundational and advanced maths to AI, data science, neural networks, decision making, and more, with new lessons added monthly. And by the way, these lessons are interactive and engaging, designed around principles of active learning. So there's no boring lectures going on here. That means that by investing just a few minutes every day in lifelong learning, you can improve your skills and feel a real sense of accomplishment.
You can try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days by clicking the link in the description. Plus, the first 200 people to do so will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. So thanks for your support and for watching TLDR.